Okay, in love for life. Building or rebuilding a great marriage. This is lesson number 10. Lesson number 10. And um, the title of this lesson is Blended Families, part one, Blended Families. Well, I guess you could say that um, everyone either knows or has uh, experienced some of the challenges of what we call uh, blended families. Um, let's just see. Let's look at the uh, statistics, shall we? First, about blended families. 48% um, of all first marriages end in divorce. That's a, that's a sad statistic, but nevertheless true. 79% of women and 89% of men remarry. 68% of remarrieds uh, have children from previous uh, marriages. Some statistics here. And again, these statistics relate to what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of lessons, and that is you know, how to improve the blended family situation. More stats, 21 new blended families formed every day in the United States. Less than 12% of divorced or single parents go to church, a little spelling mistake, go to church because they don't feel the church cares about their broken lives. To me, that's the saddest statistics. One of the, one of the, the unfortunate fallouts of divorce, other than all of the other negative things that happen, obviously the, the pain and the separation of the family, so on and so forth, is many times uh, for people, who, people of faith, uh, the divorce also leads to them leaving the church for a variety of reasons. They don't feel welcome, perhaps the family of their partner is still there, so on. There are you know, many, many reasons, but it's one of the sad facts that happens. People's faith is impacted uh, by, a, uh, by a divorce. So we're going to talk about not necessarily the divorce part. We talked about that last week in uh, remarriage and renewal. By the way, if you want to see that lesson that you missed, it's online. It's on the BibleTalk.tv website. And I would encourage you to go check that out. Remarriage and renewal. That was the one we missed because of the big snowstorm. This week we're talking about blended families because as the stats uh, indicate, people do remarry. You know, there are a lot of divorces, but people remarry and they, you know, he brings his children, she brings her children or some sort of combination and we have what's called today blended families. So we're going to be talking about that for the next uh, couple of lessons. There are a lot of books on this subject. One of the books that I've used and I, I can uh, recommend is entitled The, Be the Blended uh, Family. You see a picture of that there. A lot of information in that book if you'd like to uh, pick it up. It's not a new book. A lot more uh, recent uh, books have come out. We need to realize that blended families have always been with us. We like to think, oh, it's the modern world, but it's not the modern world. I mean, I'll give you an example, for example. Uh, Jacob, for a biblical example. Jacob, Jacob, that was a blended family. And he had two wives. And of course, he had the concubines on top of that, the slave women of his wives on top of that. And he had sons and daughters. He had, he, 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 he had a large family by different so here you had a kind of a blended family living at that very early uh, period. And of course, we see the picture of difficulties within that home, where there is not just one man and one woman in a family, and not just the children belonging to only those two people. Even in the story of Jacob, you know, who became Israel, a very holy man, uh, uh, one of the patriarchs, you know. Even in that family there were, there were problems because it was a, a blended family. In these early years, of course, the most common form of blended family, if you wish, was polygamous marriages. However, uh, as time went on and as we get into the modern age, blended families uh, usually are formed because of divorce or perhaps one person or both uh, are widowed. Today we have a variety of blended families. 
we have what's called subsequent marriages. Subsequent marriage is simply a, a, a marriage you know, beyond the first marriage. So we call those subsequent marriages, where children are brought together from different unions. That's the most common type. Another type is single parents with multi-partner children. You know, a, 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 a woman uh, who has a, a son by one partner and then had another child perhaps with a second partner and now is by herself with two or more children by a different partner. That's a, that's a blended family. Also grandparents raising grandchildren because of the death or the divorce or single parents needing help from their own parents to raise their children. So you have grandma, you have grandma, that person's child, and then that, you know, the second generation, third generation. And then you have multi-generational situations where parents live with the children or relatives and sometimes it's multi-generational with adopted children. I mean, there's so many different combinations here uh, that have a blended families. So all these forms who add adoptive or abandoned children to their households, these are blended families. Now there are probably other combos out there you know, we could go around, but these are the most, you know, the common type that we experience in our uh, society today. Now, as I mentioned, blended families present additional challenges to the ones that already exist in conventional families. We've talked about you know, conventional families and the challenges to marriage and raising children, so on and so forth, but blended families add you know, a couple of other dimensions here. So as I say, these next lessons, we're going to try to give some insight and biblical guidelines to help these families find unity, strength, greater love and of course a commitment to one another and to, to Jesus Christ. Now although there are many varieties of blended families, the most common one is the one created by a subsequent, meaning a second or further marriage, where children get new parents and vice versa. Parents get new, new children. Our study is going to use this model. You know, there are a lot of different models that I've just shown you. We can't use all the models all at once. So we're just going to pick the most common type and that's where mom or dad or whatever has been married before and brings children into a union. We'll, we'll, um, we'll use that model because it's the most common model that we, uh, that we see. All right, a little more, um, a little more statistics here. In a study of individuals who had recently gone through a divorce in a first marriage, the following reasons were given for the failure of that marriage in order of importance. Reasons for divorce in first marriages. Here's number one, immaturity. The immaturity of one of the other partners. They weren't ready. They weren't ready to get married. That doesn't just mean they were too young. I know a lot of 40 year olds that are immature. It just means they weren't ready to enter into marriage. And so the things that happen in marriage, the things you've got to do in marriage, they weren't ready for it and just got worse and worse. They, you know, they dug deeper and deeper into, into trouble over the years. Sexual difficulties, either sex before marriage or sex outside of marriage or immaturity, an immature expectation about sexuality within marriage. People have this you know, misunderstanding about what sex is going to be within a marriage and they bring a lot of worldly ideas into the marriage and uh, it causes problems. Uh, marriage prep. In other words, there was no preparation for marriage. Uh, I've often said, you know, uh, the bride will spend you know, $2,000 on a dress that she'll wear for only about two hours, but the couple will not spend 300 bucks on getting you know, a marriage prep course or going to see a, you know, a, a therapist who will kind of walk them through some of the basics about, about marriage because they either don't have time, they don't want to do that, they're in a hurry to get married, they got to plan the reception, they got to plan the honeymoon, this and that. And many times they overlook the important part about getting information about being married. The in-laws 
I didn't put the word here, but interference from the in-laws. You know, she, um, she is judging her husband by how her father is. And he is expecting her to act like his mother or serve him like his mother served him. You know, I mean, listen, we can go all day about this here. But I just like to use the word interference. And I say to uh, in-laws, you know, when you're about to offer your suggestion and your solution and this and that, one word, okay, don't. <laughs> don't. Wait to be asked. If you have a good, if you've, if you've built up a good relationship with your son or your daughter, you, know, you have a good relationship with them and that takes time, you've invested in that over the years, they'll ask you, they'll seek your counsel because you have a good relationship with them. Values conflict. Values conflict can be anything about either you know, how I um, am going to spend money or um, how I, uh, religion for example, that's the most common one, values conflict. Uh, two people who are members of the church get married. She, she's like three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible class, ladies class, you know, blah, 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 blah. He, hey, once a month, I'm good. That gets to be a problem. It's not a problem when they're dating, but it gets to be a problem, you know, when, you, when just the marriage goes on. All kinds of values conflict. Number six, adjustment problems. In other words, adjusting to married life because married life is not like single life. It takes an adjustment. You're thinking for two all the time. Child rearing. The thing about child rearing is that you don't know how you're going to be as a parent until you become a parent. It's not, you, know, you can talk all you want about, oh, aren't children lovely? And oh, let's have a lot of children you know, when you're, you're dating or you're, you know, you're engaged. But you don't really know how you're going to parent until you start having children. Then you find out how you're going to parent. And then sometimes your parenting style, not exactly your partner's parenting style, that causes conflict. And then of course, uh, finances. Um, we had a lesson about this, the money trap. So all the things we said about the money trap, you know, finances, spend too much, spend too little, earn too much, earn too little, we have different ways of handling money. Now in a related study of the main reason for divorce in second marriages and third marriages, I want you to note how the order of problems change. So reasons for divorce now in second or third marriages. Number one, child rearing becomes the most contentious part of a new marriage, of, a, of a, you know, a subsequent marriage where there are children brought in. Because one partner you know, has their child and the other partner has their child or whatever combination you want. And the problem is, I've been raising this child for nine years by myself here. Now you're coming in and you're going to have some say in the rearing of that child. Or maybe I don't want you to have any say in the rearing of this is my child. You, know, you can handle all of this over here, but when it comes to my child, I'm going to be the boss of my child. Yeah, sure, that really gets things off to a good start. Number one reason. Number two, finances. Why would you think finances would be a problem in subsequent marriage? Well, you get the same pool of money, but now you may have to be paying alimony. Or you may have to be paying for you know, somebody, some child, your child's education who happens to be in another relationship. You know, you, your wife is gone. She's, you know, you're paying alimony, you're paying child support, but you've also remarried and now you're going to be paying support for this child over here and it gets to be, uh, you know, why, why does my child in the marriage that I'm in right now, they have to go to public school, but you're forking out all this money so your child by a previous marriage can be going to private school. I mean, just try that discussion on for, for a time, see what happens there. Relatives. I didn't say in-laws, I said relatives. Because in a subsequent marriage, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody in the family thinks that they know what you ought to do. 
And in a subsequent marriage, all of a sudden you've got a lot more relatives. You got the relatives, that, you know, your, your ex-mother-in-law is still your mother-in-law, so to speak. She still has a relationship with you and she still has a relationship with your children. Even though you're in a subsequent marriage, now you've added more children. So you may have two mother-in-laws, you may even have three because, you know, so it gets complicated. Lots of relatives. Values, the value conflict heightens. Because you have the values that you had with the, your previous marriage and those children and how you're doing things and now you've got the values over here on this side, you know, how you're doing things, you may change. And also, interestingly enough, the sharing of tasks. Who's going to do what? What are we going to prioritize in this marriage? And again, no matter how hard people try, this marriage is always you know, secretly, subconsciously being compared to this other marriage over here. So that causes tension, that causes, that causes pressure. So because child rearing becomes so complicated in blended families, those who are presently unmarried, now when I use the term unmarried, that's the biblical term for someone who is divorced or widowed and who are in a single state, as opposed to the term virgin, those are for, that term in the Bible is used for those who have never been married, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So you have to understand in the Bible that when Paul is talking to the virgins, he's not just talking to people's physical state when it comes to sexuality, he's talking about single people because the assumption is that a single person doesn't have sex, so they're referred to as a virgin, women as a virgin. And a person who has been married before and is divorced is now unmarried. So widows could be unmarried. Divorcees are unmarried. So for those who are unmarried, but they're contemplating another marriage, there are four foundational principles that should be laid before going into this situation, and all of them are based on Paul's admonition in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me um, heavenward, in Christ Jesus. Now you might think that this is an awfully strange passage to use as a basis to give advice to people who are considering a subsequent marriage. In other words, perhaps getting into a blended family situation, but it's not. First of all, how to prepare for a subsequent marriage and entry into a blended family. Number one, know your mate and know your mate's children. When unmarried people begin a relationship, they tend to focus their attention on each other and they assume that the child rearing dimension needs only to be considered after the marriage. No. Dating for unmarrieds is not like dating for singles. Dating for unmarried involves the learning of the entire family system and network and allowing them to know you. you know, so many unmarrieds are looking for the, you know, the light-hearted, romantic experience of their single days, and they feel annoyed or overburdened because dating a family is not that easy. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> Others, they make the mistake of leaving one relationship, even as the victim, and rushing into another relationship without ever analyzing and acknowledging what they contributed to the failure of the previous marriage. Because they think, well, I'll just do it over again and I'll do it right this time without ever giving a moment to think about what did I do wrong? Maybe she left me. Let's just say she left me. Okay, and so I'm the victim here, but even so, what was it that I did wrong? 
Because as I've said to you, when a marriage fails, there's enough blame to go around. You know, it, it isn't always 50-50, it's 80-20, 90-10. You know? But even the person with the 10% part of blame, even that person needs to think, okay, what was my 10%? What did I do? I've found people either blame themselves too much or too little. And the key is to kind of find the, you know, the, the right measure. Still, other, people's other people remarry for reasons of loneliness, insecurity, or to provide a parent for their children, and they end up regretting it. Those are not the right reasons to get married. So the reason to marry is because you have found someone that you want to give yourself to and receive the same from. That's the reason people, I mean, even, even first marriages, that's usually why you want to get married. I want to, I want to make that person happy. I love that person and I want to give to that person. That person, you know, you know the old thing, that person makes me a better person. It makes me want to be a better person. Yeah, okay, those are the type of thoughts. When you're having those type of thoughts, wow, that's good. So this giving and this receiving is always the same no matter if it's the first or the second marriage. However, in a second marriage, it requires more effort to get to know the person that you want to give yourself to because that person has a bigger dimension. That person, if that person has children, well, you have to include those children. And if there are children, then those children are connected to grandparents and you have to kind of, you know, it's a bigger package. So the first step is to take the time, lots of time, to get to know the person and their children because they come as a package and let them get to know the real you, not just the nice you that you, you, know, that you put forward out there. So you know, it boils down to date the whole family as a group and individually when proper and possible so that you can know them. How to prepare, so know your mate and children. Number two, understand your future children's need. Children are not good at verbalizing their needs or explaining their feelings. So what they do is they act out. And a lot of times as parents, we all make the same mistake. We punish the acting out without understanding the why. Why are they doing that? So we punish the behavior, we want to stop the behavior, but we don't understand what's causing that behavior. And without getting to the root, you won't resolve the issue. You know, many times children's legitimate concerns and fears and questions may come out as an attack or a negative or a destructive behavior. Not always, but sometimes. You know, children are an important part of the equation in a second marriage and their concerns must be addressed, even anticipated, so that they can be integrated into the new situation. You'd be surprised at what the questions are that children have if, they can, if they're old enough to verbalize them. For example, how often will I see my mom or my dad, meaning you know, my bio mom, how often? Oh, okay, you're getting married, mom, you know, but does that mean I, I don't get to see dad anymore? Or where am I going to live? You know, in your mind, you're thinking, well, the children know they're going to be with me all the time, but they don't know that. The situation's changing all of a sudden. Or will I see my grandma and my grandpa? Will I be able to go you know, in the summer for the week and go fishing with grandpa? Is that gone now? Or what will my last name be? Do I have to give up my name? You know, we... Or will Uncle Charlie still be my uncle? Because now we have this new family thing happening and I, I seem to see new uncles there. What about my Uncle Charlie? He was my special uncle. Do I lose him? Or will dad or mom, whatever, come to my ball games? I mean ex-husband. Will he still be allowed? You know? This new dad is all anxious to be my buddy and want to come to my ball game. But what about my bio dad? Does he, is he cut out now? Does he not come to the ball games? 
and will you have time for me? <laughs> Makes me think, you know, will you have time now? You, oh, you're so interested in this new person in your life and I see that a lot of the time we used to have together, now you're giving it to this person. It makes me think of my grandson, our grandson, Christian. You know, he has a little sister, Sophia, and then a new baby came along, you know, the third child. And so the new baby was born and you know, Julia and Mauricio bring the new baby home, you know, and Christian, he's, he's seven. He says, Mom, I need to talk to you. And Julia says, okay, what's it about, Christian? He says, yeah, well, he says, with this new baby, he says, am I still going to be getting the same attention? <laughs> he was afraid, you know, wow, new baby, I don't get any attention. You know, the firstborn doesn't get any attention anymore. Another question, where will my space be? Do I get to keep my room? Do I get first dibs on the remote for the TV? You know, these are all questions. So we need to discuss the need to determine each person's space and idea. You know, I, tell, I tell couples, you know, remember, the number one thing everybody, mom, dad, and the kids need from each other, reassurance. They need to be reassured. So it's wise to answer these questions over and over again, even after the marriage has taken place so that children feel part of the process and have a sense of security even if the variables in their life changes. For the person who is being remarried, it's an answer to a prayer many times. It's hard being a single parent, single dad, single mom, very difficult. So they're relieved when they perhaps find a partner, someone they can love again, you know, their life is coming back together again, perhaps we're thinking about getting married, blah, blah, blah. For, so for them, this is a great thing. They're enthusiastic. They're, they're finding love again. That's wonderful. For the kids, that's, it's a threat. You know, for them, it's a threat. There's been a status quo for a couple of years. You know, all of a sudden, that's all going to change. So very important to answer their questions. Got to move here. Uh, build a new relationship. Remarried um, couples often assume that they know about marriage and relationships so they can just kind of run with it when they get remarried. Every relationship is different in its needs and expectations, strengths and weaknesses and for those entering subsequent marriages these needs need to be, uh, there needs to be rather an understanding that building a successful marriage is not any easier just because you've been married before. In other words, I've been married before, I know about this, I got it, don't worry, this, this will be a piece of cake now. That's like raising, that's like saying, I, I'll, it'll be no problem raising my second child because I raised my first child. So you know, now I've learned all the things to do and not to do. Well, we know as parents that's not true, right? Because the second kid's different than the first one. And then the third one's different than the other two and it goes on and on. Single parenting is lonely and difficult and many think that when the opportunity to remarry comes along, it's the answer to all the problems, not realizing that, we'll also, that it'll also create new challenges. Yes, it's an answer to many problems, but some new problems are going to arise as well that you need to be ready for. So take the time and be ready to start from square number one to build a strong lifetime relationship with your new partner and understand that this new person doesn't represent all of the answers. They bring some new questions as well. Number four, include everybody in the wedding. You know, a book on blended family tells the story of a boy who went away for the weekend and when he returned, his mom introduced him to his new dad. Yeah, we snuck off. While you were at camp, we went off and got married. You know, Joe, meet Pete, your new dad. Whoops. The marriage ceremony for blended families should reflect the nature of their family situation and celebrate that idea. Children should be included and encouraged to have input. If they feel part of the union from the very beginning, it will help heal the issues later on. 
Okay, so now that we've had a, a brief look at some of the issues that need to be addressed before we enter a, 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 a blended family situation, let's look at some of the key goals that blended families have um, a greater challenge in achieving from than nuclear families. Again, blended families are different. Some of the goals in, that, in their marriage and family are the same, but some are different. Of course, uh, one of the major goals is arriving at unity. Every family wants to be united and close in harmony, but for a blended family, this goal is especially, especially difficult. The difficulty with unity issues is first accepting that blended families are not nuclear families, they're a combination of two separate families. You know that other family you had there before, that first marriage, you, your first marriage, you, know, you and your first wife, it was a first marriage for both of you, you had two children together, that was first marriage. That, you know, that thing there, that's gone, that thing. You're not going to reproduce that. You only get one chance at that. You're remarrying, you're bringing children together. This, it's some, I didn't say this is worse or bad, I'm just saying it's different. And the sooner you accept that this here is different than this, the sooner you'll have a chance at succeeding. So this means that two histories, two sets of children at times, two established ways of doing and seeing things that have to be blended together to arrive at unity. So in order to achieve unity, here are some basic things that have to be dealt with in the blended family. First of all, avoid the co-conductor system. Imagine a symphony orchestra being led by two conductors. Can you imagine that? Have you ever seen it? You know, if this conductor is just off by a half a beat, just half a beat, after about 15 minutes of playing, right, it'll, be, it'll sound pretty bad, won't it? So when couples remarry with children from one or more households, the great danger is to have two families living under one roof. Long-time single parents or, div or divorced people with children are used to their own system for, discipl for discipline, for family rituals, for the use of money, so on and so forth. You know, in our family, you know, Lisa and our family, you know, we had a thing, no singing at the table. No comic books at the table. You know, when we were at the table eating supper together, what we were doing was eating supper together. And if there was conversation, it wasn't on the phone to one of your friends, your conversations to your sister or your brother or to your parents, you know, that was the time we were together and the kids bugged us about no singing at the table. You know, they thought that was, but that was our thing. Now imagine if that idea, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, oh, I, you know, I went into another marriage, another thing, and in this other family, everybody you know, sang at the table, everybody talked on the phone. You know, how do you resolve that thing? Whose way gets to, you know, what way are we going to do this? So when they remarry, the temptation is to try to maintain their independent styles or to integrate the styles instead of reestablishing a single new system for everybody. So no singing at the table, the bad way of doing this would be saying, okay, well then on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we can sing at the table. On Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we don't sing at the table. And on Sunday, we flip a coin. Whoever wins, we, you know. That's the co-conductor system. The inter don't do that. That's a very uh, medical, typical, uh, you know, uh, a medical term. Don't do that. Of course, God's word provides valuable information in describing the basic role of each member of the family. If you have your Bibles, take a look. I don't have a slide for this, but take a look at Ephesians, will you? Chapter five. If you're at the point where you're saying, what are we going to do? Take a look at Ephesians chapter five. Beginning in verse 22, very basic. Paul says, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. And then husbands 
Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And then children, he says in chapter six, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So if you're wanting a template, there's mom, there's dad, and there's children. You're looking for roles, you're looking for attitude. Paul spells it out very carefully there in Ephesians. When we start fresh, when we start new, this helps everyone know that the family system is based on a principle higher than just what they used to do or what has taken place before. The new family is now going to follow God's system for the family and everyone will cooperate in it. So, arriving at unity, avoid the co-conductor system. Two, give up your previous role. In other words, the hardest thing about seeking unity is giving up our previous role in the former family or the family system established after the first marriage dissolved. For example, single moms become the head of the house in a single parent home. And children sometimes lose their place in the order of things. You know, the oldest becomes the second oldest. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of times in a single parent household, uh, mom has uh, three children, the oldest of the children all becomes a quasi parent now, taking care of the other two and you know, managing things and then there's a subsequent marriage that happens and then that person there all of a sudden you know, has lost their quasi parental role and there's a problem there. Bachelors who marry women with children uh, are no longer responsible just for themselves. A new order of things. In a blended family, it is wise to examine each person's present role and see how it will change in the new situation. You're saying, what should we talk about? You know, we're dating and we're thinking of maybe having a subsequent marriage. You know. What should we talk about? Well, not the wedding dress and not if you're going to have you know, turkey or ham at the reception. Talk about these things. Talk about what role, what, what might have to change. You know, adults find it difficult to give up soul parenting rights and kids find it traumatic to have to share their rooms and their TVs, not to mention their parents with strangers. So knowing this in advance can be very helpful. Number three, establish some ground rules in your family. Nuclear families grow naturally from one stage to another. Blended families are grafted together from existing pieces. Now one advantage blended families have is they can discuss and agree in advance about the type of home and relationship they wish to have with each other and establish some ground rules ahead of time. You can't do that when you're raising children from, you know, from babies. But in a blended family situation, you can talk about those type of things. So establishing and agreeing and following the general ground rules is important in creating unity in a blended family because everybody's under the same new rules. For example, courtesy, kind words, politeness, consideration, and treating each other is the norm. Family rules. Establish only one set of family rules about the car, about the TV, about curfew, about discipline. When everybody knows them, they're easier to follow and enforce. Remember, you can't have a set of rules for one set of children and another set of rules for another set of children that are living in the same household. That's disaster. Number three, of course, fairness in disputes. 
Blended families have a lot of turf wars and parents need to deal fairly with all members. Usually this means that not everybody gets what they want. They have to share. Division of labor, have everybody pitch in to make the household work. When everybody is working, everybody feels part of the house. I mean, will there be groaning and complaining? You ever see a teenager go happily to go rake the yard of leaves? And then, of course, pursue spiritual goals. When the entire family knows that their life is based on faith in God and the family begins to experience a spiritual life together, they will, they will find that unity that they're looking for. So blended families, you know, they can't unite because of their past or their present situation. But, remember the passage I read at first? But, as Paul says, they are reaching forward to what lies ahead. That's why I quoted that verse. Blended families, they don't look back at the mistakes and the heartache. They don't look back at how things were. They look forward. They look to the future. To the future. They're reaching forward to what lies ahead. And what lies ahead is heaven and eternal life with God through Christ. And if the entire family can come around that idea, then you've got unity. Even if there's disparity in your history, you have unity in your future. And that's very, very important. Again, as Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. The way to unite this family, no matter how disparate it is, is to bring everyone together in Christ. In the end, the blended family will only find its true identity and unity in the name and in the service of Jesus Christ. Only He can heal the wounds and make the two into one. If He can take Jews and Greeks and bring them into one, He can certainly take two families and bring those into one successfully as well. All right, we're going to keep going uh, next week. Uh, on this uh, topic of blended families. Talk a little bit more about children and how children can adjust to this type of situation. Thank you for your attention.